this Advent season, not the things that we bring to Jesus, but to celebrate the good things that he brings to us. And we see them implied early in the Christmas story and the narratives about his birth, and then he brings them out later in his ministry. So I'm tying these uh, birth stories with our study of the latter portions of John's gospel uh, as uh, we gather together. So we're gonna, today, today we're going to look, look at uh, uh, Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 26 to uh, 45. And this is where the Annunciation is made to Mary that she will have the child. The angel Gabriel appears to her, and then uh, her reaction here. And uh, So now, Luke's Gospel. Okay, so we got Matthew last week. There we go, Luke, this week. Verses 126 and following. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came and said to her, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, Listen now, this is the role of the Holy Spirit here. The Holy Spirit <clears throat> uh, will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your native, your relative uh, Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary went and rose uh, with haste and went to the hill country to a town in Judah. And there and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit once again. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that... The mother of my Lord should come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to me, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who, who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. May God add his blessings to this reading from his word. And then we turn to John uh, 14, where we've been studying here lately. Last week we heard Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And now... We pick up on other benefits that he gives us. This is Luke, uh, John 14, uh, verses 15 to 27. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And that day, you will know that I am in my Father, 
and that you and me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he who believes, uh, he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you may, will manifest yourself to, uh, yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear from is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. One of the worst feelings is to feel alone and powerless. Anybody ever felt real alone and isolated and powerless? It's not a fun experience. One of my worst lonely moments was first year after I graduated from seminary and took my first call to the church in Miami that I served first. Uh, they always had a big uh, East ski trip in the time between Christmas and New Year. They set that up before I got there, and so it was going to leave the day after Christmas, so that was the one Christmas I never got to go home, spend any time with my folks for the first time. Even though the folks there tried to make me feel appreciated and get ready for the next things the next day, it's no one the same waking up in somebody else's house and celebrating their Christmas when I couldn't be with my family uh, or friends back home. That was not a fun experience, and then we all had even worse things than that. When you feel alone, you have no contact or emotional connection with other people. You feel unappreciated and unwanted, and family and loved ones are far away, and it leads to a deep sadness and a sense of depression. And the worst form of loneliness is even worse than that. When you have no family, when you are an orphan, a person cut off and isolated from any known kin, no family connection whatsoever. You're just an isolated being in the world. And no one to root for you or pray for you, even from afar. You're just there all on your own. This is why it's important to be part of God's family, because we can all be adopted in there, regardless of what kind of earthly family we have. But the good news of Christmas is this. We are not alone. It is all about God coming down to us and meeting us where we are and dealing with our spiritual maladies and making us whole. We saw it last week when we read about uh, uh, the Annunciation to Joseph uh, that uh, Mary, his betrothed, would have a child and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And this is what we celebrate here today. Uh, in Luke's Gospel, we have the angel coming and making the news known to her and uh, uh, that God was going to do something special. And she found favor with him as a pious young Jewish probably 17, 18-year-old girl, that she would bear God's son into the world, announced by the angel Gabriel, enacted by the Holy Spirit. I like this picture of it. This is actually from the 1800s, but it's kind of got this modern feel to it because the angel is not embodied, or you could even say that's the power of the Holy Spirit there coming upon her. So I like uh, that particular picture. The power of God is there changing her and her world and uh, inviting her into salvation history. Now, there was a professor this past week at some university up north who said uh, God sexually assaulted uh, Mary, and this is a uh, bad story that uh, God is mean and vindictive and oppressive and stuff like that, and Mary had no say in this matter. But it says right here, Mary said, May it be unto me as you have spoken. Mary gave her full consent. Why wouldn't a pious young Jewish girl want to be part of God's plan of salvation in the world? Something's wrong with your hearing. Cut off. We put you on the Okay, I'll stick to the pulpit mic here then. Thank you, Joe. I may have lost the power. Still says the battery's good, but whatever. Anyway, uh, 
But all this is brought to us by God's power of the Spirit here. And uh, this is where God is coming down to us. And Mary fully consented to this and was excited to take part in this plan of salvation in the world. God didn't send a mere messenger here. I mean, he sent the angel, as Gina talked about and stuff, to tell us about the good news. But Mary got the full dose of God's power and presence and uh, was celebrated there. And then when she goes and visits her uh, kinswoman, I don't know if she was aunt, cousin, something like that, uh, Elizabeth, who was much older, uh, the baby in her womb, John the Baptist, when as soon as Mary's, uh, they heard Mary's voice, that baby leaped for joy. And Elizabeth was full of the Holy Spirit there and proclaimed uh, the joy of meeting uh, her new Savior in the womb and uh, the mother of her Savior to whom she was related. And this changes everything. Uh, in history, it shows us the way, forgives sin, raises us to new life, uh, gives us eternal life, and adopts us into a new family. This is all being unleashed here as part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now notice that the Holy Spirit here is kind of isolated. It comes in different places. It's always, the Holy Spirit has always been here, but uh, in John's Gospel later on, as we will see in a minute, uh, becomes manifest in a new in special way. And this is what we get there later on in the teachings of Jesus in John 14, that this Holy Spirit that was enacting uh, this miracle of salvation in the life of Jesus is something that's going to be given to each and every one of us. Jesus says it's to our advantage that he goes away because he's going to send us this new helper. He will ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, and he dwells with you and will be in you, Jesus goes on to say. Um, uh, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But then he comes and imparts to us this new presence from God. So he's promising to give us something even more when he leaves. First of all, he'll give us the resurrection appearances to really validate that he is God's son, and then we will get this other helper, this spirit, who will be poured out on all flesh. And that's what Pentecost is all about. The third holiest day of the Christian year we have. Easter is the holiest, Christmas is next, and then Pentecost is the third, and the world has to discover Pentecost and learn how to make money off of it. So we get to keep this one all to ourselves. But this is where the spirit will be poured out on all flesh, that's what the prophet Joel prophesied in the Old Testament. And then they pick up on that, and uh, Peter recites that as what was happening when the Spirit is unleashed there. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people, on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see vision, and your old men will dream dreams, even upon the slave and free. Uh, my Spirit will be poured out so. All barriers are broken down at Pentecost, and God's power is unleashed. What was just used in isolated situations and manifest in a few particular times prior to this is now available for all of us. The Spirit is God's personal power and presence in our lives. The Spirit indwells, convicts, cleanses, and renews. And as Jesus says in our passage, um, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. That was a key thing for the apostles because they were going to later write Holy Scripture and needed to remember everything Jesus said and taught and how to put it into practice. So they got that down and the Holy Spirit was going to make sure that that process worked out well. Now this is what launches the whole uh, Christian movement there at Pentecost. God's Spirit is poured out on all flesh and this is an eternal, perpetual, ongoing experience for believers today. It's not a one-time event anymore. Everyone is inspired thanks to what began at Christmas. And it's kind of a process here where God the Father sends the Son into the world to be his physical presence. And then once the price is paid for our sins, then together they send the Holy Spirit to be God's ongoing power in our hearts and minds. Jesus was limited to one place in time physically, more or less. The Holy Spirit is not. 
So we go from separation from God to being adopted by God to being filled by God. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, your body is now a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. That's God's power unleashed in here. Uh, or another way to illustrate it, the Holy Spirit is God's strength in you today. Uh, when you feel weak and helpless, you're not. You have superpowers. Today we have all these movies and TV shows about superheroes and people with superpowers. Like Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, uh, Marvel Universe, uh, X-Men, all those. They're all about all these people that are, are have by endowed in some special way with powers that normal human beings don't have. Well, there's one case where this is real, and that's in the Christian life. That you have the Holy Spirit within you, you have special spiritual gifts to work and serve in the world and to make a difference in other people's lives. And this is what we get here at this time of year. We go from separation from God, as I said, to being adopted by God, to being filled with God and strengthened by God. Or as Jesus says here, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And he will send the helper as well. The world would consider Christian people orphans, cut off from uh, the rest of society. But Jesus doesn't. He's going to equip us and fill us uh, and make us agents of his kingdom. So there's no sense of loneliness or isolation anymore. We all have a calling and a purpose. Even if we have no earthly family left, we still have our heavenly family and our brothers and sisters in the Lord and our church family, and that draws us into God's presence. Here's the full uh, thing from 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you and that, that you have from God? So you are not your own. You were bought with a price. In fact, we're twice bought. Uh, uh, it says we were bought with the blood of Jesus and we were born into this world originally as God's beings. We were taken away by the power of Satan and now we're restored by the love of Jesus as our Savior. That's why Paul tells us to glorify God in our body and why immorality is not a good thing because we are corrupting the spirit within us. Let's take a couple of minutes to close this out and talk about how do we experience the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's what Jesus came to bring us. I mean, we get the baby Jesus. Everybody loves the baby Jesus, but the, the power of the Spirit is what keeps us going from day to day through the rest of the year. Well, the first step is baptism. And actually, people will debate on the order of these first two. I'll go ahead and give you the second one here. Ask Jesus to be your Savior. Some traditions we baptize first and lead people to believe, make a confession of Jesus later. That's what Presbyterians do. And uh, other traditions that baptize infants. Others say, no, you've got to have Jesus as your Savior, and then we'll baptize you. It doesn't matter. You've got to do both of those. Uh, you're not going to get the Spirit without faith and without baptism. Uh, those are the two requirements for the Spirit to come upon you first and foremost. But then once those are done, you develop the power and presence of the Spirit in other ways. First of all, Jesus says, uh, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then I will ask the Father. You know, if you're keeping the commandments, I'm going to make sure you are fully empowered to keep up that divine work. You go where Jesus goes. You follow Jesus. You do what he says. You're obedient to him because he's your Lord and Master. Uh, you can ask him. Maybe why something happened in an open sense, not in a defiant sense, and he'll explain it, but uh, he basically says, you know, this is my way. Uh, it's not negotiable. Uh, get with the program and go ahead. And we hopefully joyfully and gleefully do that. Doesn't mean it's always an easy thing to do. Sometimes turning the other cheek, loving our enemies, uh, praying for those who persecute us, and... Uh, uh, remaining righteous in the corruption of the world. Those aren't easy things to do, but it should be the desire of our heart and something we seek God's uh, power and strength to do. If you're going to keep the commands of Jesus, you've got to study them too. Get your nose in the book, learn the life and teachings of Jesus and his followers, and spend time from day to day working through the truths of his word. The Holy Spirit inspired all these writings and called the apostles uh, to remember everything Jesus said and then add 
uh, the, the, the follow-up teachings from Paul and Peter and the others, then uh, we need to take this very seriously as God's word to us. Some people say, God, speak to us. Tell us what you really want. I'm giving you about 500 pages here <laughs> of clear instructions. Go and dig into them, and you'll find direction for most every situation in life. Next is pray, seek, ask, knock, confess, meditate. Seek the power and presence of your spirit. Go before the presence. As the creed says, the, the spirit is to be worshipped and honored just like the Father and the Son. You can call on to the spirit and say, Holy Spirit, you're the power of God. We will receive power when you come upon us. Come upon me and strengthen me each and every day. And then finally, you got to remove the spiritual obstacles in your life. What little cherished habits and vices do you hold on to? And maybe not bad things. Sometimes these are good things, but God wants you to do something even better. What keeps you from excelling spiritually? We all have some things we wrestle with in our own lives that God would say, no, that's got to go if you're really going to grow in service in my kingdom. But these are just some pathways, uh, or the pathway, to make sure that the Spirit is really moving and working in your life. And this is the blessing that we have at Christmas time. Jesus wants to make sure that not only do we get a baby, we get pretty pictures of shepherds and uh, cattle and all like that gathered around the manger, but there's something bigger going on here, a longer range purpose that we don't need to forget. So we have to cultivate the power of the Spirit. But most of all, we celebrate that Jesus is God's gift to us. He came into this world to give us light, peace, salvation. And he's not going to leave us behind, powerless, weak, alone, and orphaned. He's going to give us the helper, the advocate, the counselor, uh, the Spirit, all those titles, the paraclete, uh, the alongsider, the within you, uh, power of God for you to cope with all the challenges of your life each and every day. Have you said yes to the power of, your spirit, of the Spirit in your life? This is beyond a salvation question here. We've all said yes to Jesus, hopefully. But have we consciously focused in on the power of the Spirit? That's what I want to encourage you to do, to spend some time reflecting on the gift of God's helper, comforter, advocate here that God promises to each and every one of you. Let us go to Him, call upon Him, and seek Him each and every day. And that's why Jesus says at the very end of this, peace I leave with you. We get peace by the power of the Spirit. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. The world's peace is different from the peace of Jesus. Jesus gives us the peace of, that passes all understanding. And that's why we can say, he can say to us, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Thanks be to God for his gifts and his blessings. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came in the form of a baby. You grew to be a man. You lived righteously. You faced all of our temptations and did not give in to them. You did not sin. And you died for our sins on the cross, the one sinless sacrifice for all humanity and rose to new life to validate all that you taught and said. And then you close it out by giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Unleash that power in our hearts and minds and in our church family and in our work and mission for the world, Lord, that we can truly be empowered, that we can be strong, not by our human will and strength, but by your divine will and strength. Bless us in these ways, for we seek it in your holy name, Lord Jesus, and in the name and power and presence of the Spirit and the Father as well. Amen. Let us respond to this message of God's great gift to us by singing a hymn of conviction and uh, joy and celebration. Number 249, O come all you faithful.